and welcome to a day packed with hugely relevant and insightful talks from industry leaders and innovators. The team here at National Health Executive has been busy behind the scenes preparing an event which promises to inspire education, innovation and collaboration within the community. It's worth noting that all the content from today is CPD certified. For every hour of content you watch live today, you'll earn one CPD point. The NHE team will issue your individual CPD certificates following the event. And aside from the talks, there are plenty of opportunities to network at each break. You can connect and learn from other delegates here today using our speed networking functionality, regardless of whether you've been to one of our NHE 365 virtual events before, or you're new to the platform, you'll hopefully be interested to hear we're building much more than just a series of singular disconnected events. We really have taken the time to listen and have created a platform which will allow you to access a wealth of resources and continue to provide networking opportunities. Located all in one place, this platform, or community as we like to call it, is intended to share useful information long after today's event is over. So please jump into the digital marketplace to gain access to valuable insights you and your teams can digest at your leisure. Without support from our partners, events like this simply wouldn't be possible. Focusing on what's topical to the healthcare industry, today we'll be concentrating the conversation on reaching a net zero NHS by 2040 as part of the campaign for a greener NHS. This strategy stems from the NHS accounting for 4% of the nation's total emissions. We'll be discussing NHS estate and its accompanying facilities services, accounting for 15% of total carbon emissions, and pharma accounting for 25% of emissions within the NHS, with two areas in need of intervention being aesthetic gases and inhalers. Looking to the future, we'll be exploring efforts made across the states, supply chain and medical gases to move to low carbon alternatives. We'll also be strategizing and innovating solutions to any other areas we identify today that need engagement too, in order to achieve that net zero NHS. And there's another benefit to today's proceedings, a bit of friendly competition to reward you for your hard work. Score points by engaging with the platform's different elements and potentially earn yourself a choice of reward come the end of play. Our gamification tools will be active throughout the day with an up-to-date leaderboard tracking delegate progress. So those who finish in first, second and third places respectively We'll have the choice of three different prize options to a total of 250, 150 and 100 for each of the positions. So you can choose from either Amazon vouchers, a donation to a charity of your choice, or the one I really like is the planting of an equivalent number of trees, whatever resonates with you most. But of course, you can only be in with a shout by getting out there and engaging. So please do so. Join the live session, there's 50 points earned. Make a connection with another delegate on the platform, that's 100 points. Ask a question in a session or engage with one of our exhibitors, another 50, you get the gist. And finally, as we get ready to welcome and hand over to our first speaker, feel free to share interesting things you hear throughout the day across social media. I've done a post already. Make sure you use the hashtag NHE365, that's hashtag NHE365. So let's kick off. First up on our virtual stage is Cameron Hawkins, Head of Energy and Environment at NHS Property Services, which own roughly 10% of the NHS estate. Cameron joined the team in December 2018 and since then has employed some brilliant schemes within the organisation to reduce its environmental impact. In 2019, Cameron led the team in launching its three-year energy and environment strategy, which has so far resulted in a total saving of 16.6 million and 14,300 tonnes of CO2 equivalent across NHS PS sites. Cameron will be discussing the importance of decarbonising the NHS estate, the challenges facing the healthcare system in reaching its net zero goals, and sharing some examples of how his team has been able to make such significant reductions in its carbon use over the past two years. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce Cameron. Thank you and good morning. Thank you, Helen, for that introduction. Um, if we can um, jump to the next slide, please, my first slide. Um, 
in, in, in preparation for the presentation today, it, it uh, gave me an opportunity to reflect on the last couple of years and the, and the changes we've seen we've, we've, um, while we've been dealing with a, a pandemic that has, has changed how we live, work and play and, and established a new norm. Um, it's given us an opportunity for all of us to be able to reflect on, on how we live our lives. <clears throat> so when in uh, September 2020, uh, David Attenborough uh, joined Instagram and asked for a global response to climate change and conservation, um, a message that Greta Thunberg, scientists and, and protest groups such as Extinction Rebellion have been using their own methods to try and get across. And it wasn't received as just another call to action. It, it, it broke social media records. Outperforming friend star Jennifer Aniston and, and turning Sir David into one of those uh, elite influencers in the world, um, engaging yet another group of society along the way. Um, for those of us that have been working in this industry for, for a while now, um, in my case, my, my whole career, and um, that's a, only if you discount the time I was delivering newspapers and working in fast food restaurants as a kid, um, you know, this ask is, is no surprise to us. It's, it's something that we've been working towards, um, often out of a personal passion but often under the constraints of trying to get a commercial payback um, or the, um, using the threat of um, legislation to try and get some funding to be able to actually implement some of these aspects. Now, um, as you can see on this, this slide, I kind of reference the, um, the recent release of the um, IPCC report. Um, and I thought the, the, the BBC summarised it quite well in saying that climate change is widespread, rapid and intensifying, and it is down to us. Now, taking the old uh, saying that a picture is a thousand words, um, it's hard to go past um, having a uh, show us your stripes image um, of average temperatures. Um, one I I've got here is, uh, is from the UK. Um, but I think we, the reason why we see it so often is because it paints such a good image in terms of um, you know the situation that we're in. And there's increasing temperatures and, and to back up the IPCC report in terms of the uh, not only the increasing temperatures, but our influence that we're having on it. And um, so it's, it's hard to get away from the message now. It's, it's continually getting reinforced um, and that we need to take this immediate and sustained action. And that's not only to, to limit the damage, but also to prepare for the change that's, um, that's already happening around us. So it, uh, it came as no great surprise when, when NHS England committed to being net zero, but uh, when they released the carbon footprint, it was um, going to always be a challenging target, I think. And then when uh, they decided to, to beat the government to it, and, and say, well, 2050 is not good enough. 2040 is, 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 is where we want to um, target. Is it just increases that challenge, and, and I think it was one that one that was needed to actually really put the line in the sand to say that as such a big consumer, as such a big contributor to the UK's uh, carbon footprint, it was a challenge that needed to be laid down. Now, so when this came out, I thought, oh well, I have a little bit look at it a little bit further, and it, I think it came. Um, quite clear, and as, as Helen mentioned in the opening statement, is that um, this isn't a challenge that is just limited to one area. We've, we've got clinical services with you know, um, anaesthetic gases and inhalers, et cetera, like this. Uh, you've got the infrastructure side of things, and we've all got the source of the suppliers. And we've all got quite a uh, key role to be able to play in this. Now, I was admit, I will admit, I was half expecting the, the, the Greener NHS team to, to put some greenwash on it and to potentially dilute it. Um, just due to the sheer scale um, of the challenge that was available. But um, I have to say, in credit to them, and, and picking up the challenge of not only uh, setting the target of 2040, um, but the way that they've gone through and outlined um, the targets around the NHS carbon footprint, which covers our typical scope one and scope two emissions. Um, it's also outlined that uh, the NHS carbon footprint plus. Um, and so that brings in our scope three emissions and our supplier base into consideration. So not a small challenge, no greenwash here. This is quite ambitious targets. Um, and so I think as a system, we've got an obligation to be able to try and pick up this challenge and deliver it. Now, I'll also point out that um, hopefully you've all seen the, the agenda for today. And, and my credit goes to um, NHSE in terms of being able to uh, get the necessary speakers together to be able to actually cover all these topics. And, and so hopefully there is uh, something here for you, uh, for everybody for today. Um, and as Helen said, um, I'm the Head of Energy and Environment from NHS Property Services, and uh, we have the role as uh, landlord and service provider to, to about 10% of the NHS. So um, if you put that into some numbers, that's, that's about 3,000 sites. Um, we have over 7,000 different tenancies. 
Uh, we have 5,000 uh, staff. Um, most of those are actually cleaners, uh, frontline staff. And I've been going around through throughout the pandemic and sort of making sure that the hospitals and health centres have been cleaned. But in the, the context of today's uh, conversation is, is when we did our carbon footprint, we've got over 100,000 tonnes of CO2 that we, we produce annually. Um, now that is predominantly from um, electricity and gas. Um, gas being obviously our, probably our biggest challenge uh, going forward in terms of what that will look like. But we've also got that challenge around being a landlord. So why we might provide the infrastructure and, and um, the mechanism for, for people to be able to use energy. Um, we've got this uh, interaction with our tenants, et cetera, to be able to uh, work out how they want to use the site, whether it's going to be used for uh, birthing pools, chemotherapy, and uh, whether it's your local GP practice. And being able to understand what the demands are of that site so that we can not only try and meet the NHS's targets of being net zero, but also making sure that we've got a, a infrastructure and healthcare facilities that, that are going to be fit for purpose for years to come. So there's no, no getting away from it for us, um, us at uh, Property Services. So we've, we've recognised that. And as Helen said, we've been working quite hard in, um, over the last, last couple of years in terms of what we've been describing as our enabling phase. Um, we've gone through, we've we relaunched our engagement program. Um, we've been able to convince our, our CFO to, to give us a bit of cash to be able to invest. And, and as we've been able to invest and uh, be able to produce um, commercial paybacks and actually uh, bring our cost savings um, back to our tenants, um, the organisations felt more and more comfortable in terms of releasing more money to us. Um, so as, as uh, Helen said, we've had um, over 16 million pounds worth of savings um, in the last two years, and we should be uh, comfortably on track to be able to exceed, um, to get over, over 20 million um, by the end of this year. Now, while uh, the grid decarbonising has, has helped um, us reduce our carbon footprint, um, we've also been able to actively reduce that by, by 14,000 tonnes. And as I said, that's been predominantly around installing LEDs, uh, getting some good BMS, um, strategies in place, um, disposing, repurposing um, the NHS portfolio. Um, a lot of people might not recognise um, our role, but we are often asked to go through an optimiser portfolio. So to be able to look to see where uh, critical community services are required, um, what the local trusts need to be able to provide those services, and then optimise the portfolio in that regards. So making sure that we have got the best buildings there to be able to um, provide the NHS with its services long term. Now, um, as I mentioned, we were in this enabling phase and, and a lot of that was to get the necessary data and information together to be able to, um, so that we could actually start to make some of these long term commitments. Um, one of these such uh, commitments, I'm, I'm pleased to say that I can now make public, um, is that our executive committee um, and our board um, have agreed um, to achieving net zero carbon by, by 2040. Um, now, while this has been a, an aspiration for, for some time, and, and, and I appreciate many, many others have, have uh, been able to make this commitment before us, um, we wanted to make sure that all parties were informed and, and that what was going to be required to be able to deliver this in, in terms of resource, funding, and the changes to the organisational structure um, was all going to be in place and everybody knew what their role was. So while it's taken um, a while for us to be able to get the business case together, um, the challenge has been accepted, um, as I say, by, by everybody in the organisation, and and, uh, and that is now back to my team to be able to, to coordinate that and to be able to deliver that. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, please. So uh, I think it's in, in terms of building the, the business case and, and to, to be able to deliver to net zero carbon. Um, I think it's, it's fair to say we've learned a lot, um, particularly around what it means to decarbonise. Um, and we're finding that this is a very different conversation to what we've been having previously in terms of um, how can we make our sites more energy efficient? How can we get cost savings? Um, what do we need to do um, to be able to comply with various bits of environmental legislation? Um, now, with any bit of uh, learning, uh, it hasn't all gone to plan. Um, and we've kind of been able to identify these these sort of five areas as probably being our biggest challenges um, in terms of uh, not only getting us through that enabling phase and understanding what the problem is, but also in terms of what we see the future challenges in terms of what we need to be able to have in place um, to be able to deliver net zero. Now, 
historically, um, myself, 20 odd years as, as being an energy manager, um, you know, the role that I've had and, and various energy managers and, and sustainability managers will probably recognize is that um, we've, we've been tasked to try and reduce costs and carbon, but always ensuring that there was enough, enough cost savings there to ensure the scheme had a commercial payback. Um, now, this always resulted in, in, in you know, your easy wins, your low-hanging fruit. So these these being things like lighting, controls via building management system, and and trying to find those marginal gains that you could achieve when when you had a large bit of kit being replaced. So this might have been a pump. Okay, we're replacing a pump. Can we put variable speed drives on it? Oh, we're putting an air handling unit in it. Can we put um, heat recovery in it? Can we put uh, lower temperature heat exchangers in that? Or when we're replacing boilers, can we move to something that's more energy efficient when, um, in terms of whether that's condensing boilers or, or something else. So, and when we got to the new build situation, again, you had those challenges around um, how much could you put into the initial spec and how much would then be valued engineered out of it as, as those finance and those, those critical um, services started to come into play and those conversations around what can we actually afford. Um, we used to always get a bit clever. Um, I, I'm sure people would, would recognise that you'd, you'd had to get a little bit, bit creative and you'd start to add like maintenance savings and whole life cost savings um, into these sort of business cases to try and increase that, that model and try, try and increase the savings that you would achieve to be able to justify the projects. Now, as I mentioned, um, we've been uh, relatively successful at, at property services um, over the last couple of years. We've been able to invest um, over eight million pounds into LEDs. Um, that's converted 80 odd sites um, to 100% LED lighting. Uh, and this is a, project, a program that we, we see continuing for um, across the next five years until we can kind of get our whole um, portfolio converted to LEDs. Now, some of those will be through bespoke projects standalone projects because as I mentioned before the, the commercial payback is there um, but we'll also pick that up and through um, our large customer schemes where we go through and modifying space to make sure that they're fit for purpose but also we've put schemes in place to be able to make sure that we pick up um, those as part of our reactive maintenance so if a light was to go that we can make sure that we're not replacing those light for like that we are going through and making those efforts to be able to go through and um, as we go, um, put LED lighting in and um, to get those energy savings, carbon savings along the way. Um, we've also been able to install some artificial intelligence, uh, a little little black box um, that goes through and sits um, on your building management system. Um, what this does will go through and this will analyse uh, what bits of plant are being turned on and try and find inefficiencies in terms of how the system is being run. Um, while I've used this many times in the past, um, I'm pleased to say that one of the sites that we've been running it on recently, uh, we've been able to reduce energy consumption by over 22%, um, with paybacks being less than three months. Um, so while we're understanding and why we've been able to build, uh, build a good track record in terms of being able to um, introduce energy efficiency and, and cost savings. What we've been able to find is that when you actually start to look to build the business case to decarbonize, um, we find that you have to uh, need to widen the scope. Just beyond these, you know, we can no longer just look at these um, commercially viable solutions as um, what we're finding is they, you know, these aspects that you need to decarbonize typically won't fit into a five-year lease or, or a refresh program if you're um, if you're having to refresh spaces on a regular basis. Um, and insulation is a, is, a, is, a, is a perfect example of this, which is uh, can be very complicated and, and therefore very expensive in a retrofit um, situation and, and often won't meet that, that commercial payback of maybe a three-year payback that you might have for a standalone project. But now when we are faced with the challenge of saying, okay, we need to decarbonize, it is not just about these, these, these small gains that we need to make along the way. We need to make fundamental changes to our sites. So, for example, when you're uh, faced with the challenge of being able to, you've got a boiler, a uh, gas boiler that's reached the end of the life, and you're looking to be able to replace it with a heat pump. Um, the, being, the ability to be able to reduce the demand at that site in the first place has multiple impacts and flows on across across the, the scheme. So being able to reduce that demand for heating in the first place means that you can actually reduce the size of your heat pump that you need to buy. So this will actually then will actually have lower capital costs um, for, for when you're actually trying to find a bit of a replacement kit for it. But what we're also finding is that our sites, our infrastructure isn't actually being designed to take that size of that electrical load. 
So now you've got a, a building that's been, been designed and you've got the electrical infrastructure that, that's been designed in it to be able to provide your lighting, your small power, in our cases it might be an MRI scanner or a hydrotherapy pool. Um, those sorts of aspects uh, you know, have all been sized up for it. But there's that expectation that the gas infrastructure will provide that hot heating and hot water load. So there isn't that power, there isn't that um, infrastructure to the site. So if you aren't able to reduce the size of the energy consumption within your site beforehand, in terms of what we're describing as enabling works, is that that size or that um, cost to be able to increase the electrical infrastructure in your building can be a stop, a showstopper for the, the installation to go ahead on, as its own. So if you're able to reduce that demand, reduce that extra, um, uh, and create additional electrical capacity, electrical um, uh, extra bandwidth, you might say, um, of power going into the site, um, it means that you can then, as I say, reduce the size of the heat pump that you need up front, but it also gives you that extra capacity and having to um, reduce the size of the cable that you need in the first place. Um, now, one of the other points that's probably not mentioned very often, and, and uh, and when we've been looking at it from a whole life cost model aspect, is that electricity is actually three to five times more expensive than gas. And particularly those that have, have, have seen how uh, the market has reacted recently to, to the gas supply shortages and, and seeing prices sort of uh, double, if not triple, um, from last year, there's real cost pressures in terms of how we run our buildings. So again, if you're able to insulate, if you're able to get these enabling works in uh, up front, it means that actually the ongoing running costs of your organization is actually going to be a lot less as well. So now, once you start to bake all those aspects in together, bring them all together, you actually, if you were just to look at insulation on its own as a retrofit project, you wouldn't do it. it it's, it's, um, would be something if you did a large scale um, project or anything like this, um, it, it's quite often was just put into that too hard basket. But now with this decarbonization conversation going on, um, it is a one that once you take it holistically, insulation is a great option um, because it not only will it reduce your upfront costs, but it'll also un, um, reduce your ongoing running costs as well. And I'll touch on electric vehicles a little bit later on um, because again, they're going to also be competing for that electrical supply that's coming into the building. So it's a very long way of saying, I guess, that you can you know, no longer just tweak a specification. It's, it's no longer just asking for LEDs instead of fluorescence. It's it's no longer just asking for a 30-year-old boiler to be replaced by a modern, you know, hopefully condensing boiler. Is, is, um, you know, we need to look at that full system. Now, a lot of the projects that we've been able to do is we've been able to do them as a standalone. We've been able to um, engage with the local team, um, get the necessary finance available, and we've been able to get that project implemented. But now, when we're having to look at this, you need to engage process, engage more people in the process. And this is around, uh, you know, what is the actual the base specification of the building? What will it be used for? And actually getting that design right at the very first instance. Because as I said, putting insulation is, in, is um, one of the key aspects to be able to decarbonize. So if you can design that in, in the first aspect, it becomes a lot cheaper. Um, when you move on to that build process is making sure that these aspects aren't valued engineered out. You know, making sure that the actual design is actually um, implemented on site so that we aren't uh, having drafts, we aren't having um, leaks within the building. Um, we are getting the necessary specification of the kit put in. And then there's always that commissioning stage, the, the, the point where we're actually, has the design become a reality and are we actually making this, this sure? Um, but it doesn't stop there for us. Uh, as I said, we're a, we're a service provider as well. So we, we don't, uh, it's not just a case of building a building, building a new hospital, building a new health center. Um, it's also then we've got the responsibility to be able to run it afterwards. So, uh, and when I mean by run it, it's, it's that uh, aspects of uh, maintaining it. Um, also, um, if it was to break, we've got to fix it. Um, and then at the end of life, uh, we've got to then replace it again. So it's, and making sure that it, the nature of how the, the site is actually run and those specification changes that have come through that across to all parties involved. So it might uh, result in different um, ways that people engage with the site and, um, in terms of how people run it and also making sure that their expectations are understanding that it won't be just a case of um, uh, you'll be able to turn on the hot water etc like that and it's there. 
you know, that is what we want and that is how it's going to happen. But that um, in terms of the maintenance behind the scenes, there might be some different systems and processes. There won't be a gas boiler sitting there on the wall for you anymore. Um, so that's the first turn. I, I think the middle one, I think it goes the, the, for budgets. I think the challenge for budgets uh, kind of speaks for itself. Um, we're all we're all here at the the mercy of um, public spending, and and uh, it's our taxpayers' money at the end of the day that we want to make sure is uh, is being implemented correctly. And I think it's comforting from my side of things that we've we've seen schemes like uh, the Low Carbon Skills Fund uh, come through, and the Public Sector Decarbonisation Scheme be be produced. Um, now these two are uh, key schemes in terms of how we're going to actually push forward. In terms of being able to, to to deliver it, now for those that are unaware, um, the Low Carbon Skills Fund is money that you can apply for um, to be able to get your portfolio and uh, also site level decarbonised. Um, unfortunately, phase two of this uh, was 15 million, um, and that recently I was told that 20 million pounds worth of applications was applied for in the first two days. Um, there was also the Public Sector Decarbonisation Scheme. Again, this is how. You Oh, sorry, no worries. I've been told I've been talking too much. So um, I think in terms of funding, etc., like this, there is there is mechanisms out there, but um, you will need to get that data and that information to, uh, together in the first place. Uh, so good luck, everybody. Um, as you can see, there is plenty to talk about. And uh, um, if you would like to more, know more, um, please let me know. But um, as I say, I've got plenty to talk about on this one, but I'll hand back to others to, to continue the conversation. Thank you very much, Karen, for starting today's conference off. Uh, sorry that you were wrapped there a little bit, but um, you were making some fantastic points. And uh, I think it was a really perfect way to set the scene and understand some real life examples of lowering carbon output. So uh, our thanks. So next this morning, we have our first leaders debate, the subject NHS estates. This discussion will cover the government's net zero hospital standards that were recently implemented. These outline how low carbon materials need to be used and that the new design must be flexible to adapt to changes in how care will be delivered in the future. The standards should not only be applied to hospitals themselves, but implemented across all building facilities in the NHS estate. We'll also look at all aspects of ensuring net zero compatibility is met in both new builds and in the process of upgrading existing properties. So with me to delve into this topic are Matthew Tully, Director of Built Environment, Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, Michelle McCann, Estates, Facilities and Professional Services Category Director, NHS London Procurement Partnership, Ian Stenton, National Sustainability Programme Manager, NHS England and NHS Improvement. Paul Graham, Waste and Sustainability Manager, Kingston Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. And Kirti Rudra, Energy and Carbon Solutions Director at NG. Remember, this is your opportunity to ask any questions that you may have of our panellists. And I want to make sure that these debates today really feel like a conversation with me simply facilitating. So you can pose a question using our live Q&A function, which you'll find on the right hand side of your screen. And once we get our chat going, I'll ask as many of those questions as I can. So uh, very good morning to all of my panellists. Um, Matthew, perhaps we can start off um, with you. And is this net zero early target achievable do you think that's a million dollar question to start the day with yeah i think it's slightly more than a million dollars isn't it the um <laughs> i think i think it, it, it is it, it's it's a really important, important debate to have and I, I i so i i i had the sort of enormous privilege and pleasure actually last year of sitting on the um uh, the sort of advisory panel that worked on look at on the net carbon zero sort of standards and targets and actually what what should the nhs's ambition be and that was something we discussed quite a lot as to what's the realistic target and what is the you know what, what's that balance between being suitably ambitious but also also realistic because if you set something that's that, that's just sort of pie in the sky it'll put every, everyone off but at the same point uh, in time i think we all we all see i think i say we all see many people see that you know there really is a climate emergency and the longer we put off action doing action and taking action the more it'll, more it will cost cost eventually so so i i think as to whether it, whether the targets are actually the achievable well, you know, that is that is the more than multi million dollar question but I, I think to have that ambition and have, have targets which are quite you know are challenging and stretching is really really important because it, it's that it's then that focus it, it says it says to people this is important 
and so so do focus on it yeah, make it a priority make it important and actually then think about the things that you can do both you know near term and we, you know we can all do things today we you know we can all think of probably something one thing to do today that's that's going to make a difference but then also think about what do we do in three years time five years time and ten years time etc so whether it's achievable who knows it's ambitious but actually we should absolutely strive for it that was a very good first answer. Kirti, I noticed that you were smiling there and uh, nodding away, probably relieved I hadn't asked you that. <laughs> That's the first question, but another equally uh, tough one. What are your, what do you think the challenges are that lay ahead as we try and achieve that target? I think um, just um, going on from Matthew's points, I think the NHS has a portfolio of sites. You have your ageing acute estates with complex steam infrastructure. So decarbonisation of heat is critical there. So where you make the decision to extend steam. I think that needs to be reconsidered and looking at LTHW solutions. So solutions for decarbonisation of heat, I think is quite critical and working out methods to look at that from an investment point of view and a long-term strategy. Um, the capability and the capacity and the knowledge around the measures available, the grant, the financing, that sort of understanding of how you get to net zero. I think involves partnering with experts to, to support on the journey because against the backdrop of COVID and other, other distractions that the NHS are fighting with, it's quite difficult to focus your efforts on net zero in a whole. So having a partner that can provide that support so that primary activities can be focused on is critical. Um, and then the um, actual engagement of regional communities and bringing the whole anchor institution aspect through would be critical for me. Ian, you've re recently started as National Sustainability Programme Manager for states and facilities within NHS England. What do you think states and facilities need to be really focusing on in relation to working towards net zero? Well, like the other speakers and like Cameron as well, the focus really is on decarbonisation of heat. That's going to be the big challenge. There's been loads of amazing work across trusts nationally regarding LED light installations and installation of renewables. But the, the decarbonisation of heat is, is the big one for all the reasons that Cameron said about electrical capacity, what Kitty just said about the, the knowledge and the capacity and the funding for that. Um, I think going back to Matthew's point regarding the targets being achievable and ambitious, I think one of the great things with the NHS net zero target is it's not just 2040, but we also have the 80% target between 2028 and 32, and that really helps to bring the focus forward on decarbonisation of heat, the, the majority of plant that's in, in hospitals or in healthcare buildings or is being installed has a long life and if we're looking at an 80% reduction within only 10 years that we really need to start looking now at how we can introduce electric led heating or, or move certain move away from fossil fuel heating um, and, and that, that's what I think a lot of the focus for estates will be over the next five to ten years. Just bringing you into the conversation Michelle just thoughts on what's been said so far and and you know and what your thinking is basically. On the decarbonisation of heat so I think um, the um, what Cameron said, I echo it uh, absolutely. You know, we can't just be picking up specs and uh, re retendering what we had. This is this is you know entering into uh, uncharted waters, and so we need to um, we need to work with uh, experts and procurement teams. Um, and we need to share the knowledge and the learnings that we get from the earlier uh, schemes that go ahead so that we can develop uh, specifications that are fit for future and that can get us to where we need to be. Because, uh, you know, the systems that we have, especially trying to retrofit into, you know, pre-war buildings, you know, it, it, it's going to be immense and, uh, you know, we need to not only um, develop the right specifications, but we then need to ensure that the contracts that we put in place are um, contract managed so that uh, we don't end up in uh, 10 years time having something that then needs to be uh, ripped out because it is it is no longer fit for purpose. So we need to, you know, we need to think and we need to plan um, and, and ensure that, you know, instead of rushing into a procurement, we have, we've, we've thought about all of the angles 
and you know we're putting something in that is maintainable for the foreseeable future um, and is also sustainable and is helping to um, get us to that net zero target. Future proofing so difficult, isn't it? I think with technology and you know data changing so rapidly, it's um, you know it's a real task making sure that whatever's put in now is going to be fine in five, ten, fifteen years. Um, Paul, it's always difficult when you've got five great brains on a panel and I feel like I've come to you last but I wondered if we could perhaps take obviously we can get your thoughts on what's been said already but I wondered if we could take Kingston where you are as a bit of an example and hear what you're doing to make net zero a reality and whether you've got a formal green plan in place for the site. Sure well um, yeah Kingston as with most other trusts uh, heating and powering the site is what generates most of our carbon emissions um, we're currently running a gas fired combined heat and power plant on a steam infrastructure. So it's old, but it works. Um, and you know, it's efficient and it's relatively cheap to run, but it's awful for carbon. So we're currently coming to the end of that contract. It's the top priority at the moment to try and work out what to do next. Um, we don't know exactly when we'll be able to shift to low carbon generation, but we're hoping to de-steam the site in the next couple of years, uh, which will set us up for low carbon in the future. Paul and Michelle, I just wondered if you could tackle maybe perhaps starting with you, Paul, you know, what's getting in the way? What are what are the barriers? Oh, um, <clears throat> well, some of it's being overcome by having a target. That means we have to act and we have to act soon. Um, that really helps. Um, having a 10 years time to reduce our carbon by 80%. That means we have to do it in this round of change rather than waiting for a future round. Um, so that's really helpful. We're working on a green plan now to help that along. Um, senior management time and attention is scarce on this subject, but it's growing. I was invited to present to the execs recently, which um, because they'd heard about net zero and that it's an important thing. So that really wouldn't have happened without the great work of NHS England on this. Um, they're really raising the priority. Um, our head of net zero is our finance director. So that's helpful too. <laughs> That is helpful, very helpful. Michelle, would you like to add to that in terms of barriers to procuring? Yeah, so to me, um, funding is um, generally seen as one of the major barriers, the way the NHS is currently funded. Um, a lot of the trusts uh, are running deficit budgets, and so cash savings, in-year cash savings are very important. Um, but some of these sustainable solutions don't necessarily deliver the cash savings in year one. So I think we need a behavioural change to move away from lowest cost uh, and move to a total cost of ownership model where we can um, we can present the, 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 the savings over the life of a project rather than um, in year one. Um, and so that will require uh, uh, not only a, a behavioural change, but also in terms of procurement, a, a different way of presenting commercial schedules so that we can do that analysis and report to boards on the, the savings over the life of the project. And I think Cameron touched on the other one, which was uh, power demand. So as we as we decarbonize and as we move away from um, a lot of our traditional um, uh, sources of energy, um, the demand on the power grid and on the, the trust capacity is going to be greater and greater. So demand management is going to be really important to make that uh, work. Kirti, have you, could you give us maybe some examples of effective engagement of the supply chain that you've seen deployed throughout NHS trusts? Oh, I don't think we've got Kirti's sound, have we? Yes. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Again, I think we've lost your sound there okay. for a moment. Apologies. Um, so where the supply chain is engaged right at the front to inform tenders and actually scope what the requirements are. I think that's a good example where it's effective engagement, where you're getting expert insights. Um, we've also seen examples um, of NHS trusts actually engaging with local communities and involve, involving supply chains in sort of um, insulating homes to prevent um, sort of damp, which in turn reduces respiratory diseases, that reduces the burden of the NHS. So that whole social um, aspect of how you can change, transform a community with net zero um, at the core 
and then the subsequent impact I think is quite key. Matthew, it's not all negative stuff, is it? Where are the greatest opportunities here, looking at it with the sort of glass half full but overflowing mentality, really? The NHS sort of leadership on this and the report is really important because it, get, it gets attention uh, of the exec team and the board, uh, which has certainly been important at Imperial over the last um, the last year to to, to, to raise raise this up the agenda. I, I think I think uh, I think one of the things, the opportunities, which uh, Curtie was just sort of. Um, uh, uh, touching upon it is actually why we've talked obviously the, the nature of this particular panel discussion about states we talk a lot about you know heating and boilers and hot water and that kind of stuff but actually the the the, the real opportunities are around actually um the nature of how we deliver clinical services and where they're delivered and um you know so that 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 could be uh, things like, you know, one of the, you know, if there are if there are any good things to come out of the pandemic, there's the, been the, the rapid shift to some uh, video um, uh, 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 outpatient appointment, remote working, and, and and actually forcing what would have taken been a ten year change to happen in about three days in our case. So um, there's, the, I think, I think there's a lot of opportunities about how we deliver services and where we deliver services. We need to look at that and be really, really. Um, you know, are really focused on where's the best place to do stuff. With also taking into account carbon, you know, carbon carbon impacts. Um, the social prescribing Curti talked about with insulation. I mean, years ago, I say years ago, probably ten years ago, uh, some really innovative GP practices and trusts and um, Bart's Health did it in East London. I know there were some GP practices in the Northeast. Um, would 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 as part of that would, would prescribe new boilers. You know, somebody would go in and they'd be ill and they'd prescribe a new boiler because oddly enough, you heat somebody's house. They Get, they don't get ill. Um, so I think actually the wider thinking about this and thinking about the NHS sort of carbon um, carbon consumption in, 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 in the broadest fashion, such that you get to the point where the estate's consumption, you know, you minimise that, you've got the decarbonisation of the grid, you get retrofitting or new build, is, is almost the last thing you need to, it's not the last thing, but it's the, almost the last thing you need to think about because actually you're minimising you're minimizing use. And, and, and the last the last thing I'd say is again we talk about buildings a lot, but um, the, act, the 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 use of the buildings by the staff is super important, and behavioural change and getting people to understand uh, what what you know where they can where, where they are consuming unnecessary um, energy because again there's lots and lots of opportunities to re even in old buildings to re reduce um, energy use through behavioural change of of the staff. Ian, I'll be with you in a minute because I'm aware that. You haven't had a voice for a little while, but Michelle, um, just off the back of what Matthew said there, how important is it to involve the clinicians and, uh, you know, other end users of estates and facilities and, and bring them into the gen into the agenda? I think it's absolutely important. I think that, you know, we should have end users and, uh, and, and staff involved in the development of specifications. And I think um, prior to that, they should be part of the discussion to see whether by changing some of the uh, internal processes, we can affect uh, the, the, the demand for the, uh, the service in the first place. So I think we were talking earlier about um, energy use. So, you know, by changing some of the internal processes and the way that uh, clinics are run, we could then reduce demand. Um, if we think of something as simple as uh, waste management, if we can get better segregation of waste at source, then we will have um, less waste being, um, in, you know, going into the wrong waste streams. And some of the waste streams that the NHS has are very expensive to uh, process. Clinical waste, uh, the incineration costs are astronomical at the moment. So, you know, by, by working with the clinicians and the staff to um, improve processes, we can then affect the way that the, 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 the demand on the service is, is, is led. In these debates, Ian, people are always at the heart, but you know, it also does boil down to money as well, doesn't it, and funding. And I just wondered what supports out there centrally to support trusts and, and primary care as they you know, try to achieve these ambitions. Yeah, well, with regards to the funding, there's obviously been the public service dec um, decarbonisation scheme funds and the, the NEAF funds for LED lighting that we've been able to get out to the system. And that's made a real difference and been able to help with the business case. I think the, the, 
the support going forward will be more around the the, the guidance and, and how we can help trust and, and all the things really that Michelle was talking about that to share best practice that we know what what's happening where it happens well why can't other trust do that um, with things like the um, estates net zero delivery plan which we're hoping to publish shortly that goes through a lot more detail about what trusts can do and the steps they can take for decarbonisation and I totally echo what Michelle and Paul said about it's really helpful centrally for us to be able to put messages out saying what needs to be done and the targets are really helpful. Obviously I've had nearly 10 years experience in trusts and being able to go to board to say this needs to be done rather than this is something that we'd like to work towards does make a difference. So some of the support that will be come out will be be this estate's net zero delivery plan and that includes the data from University College London that informed the delivering a net zero NHS report as well, but with a focus on estates. And then it goes wider to look at things such as circular economy, waste, active travel and um, low, low carbon travel, climate change adaptation, all the things that are really important and should be considered by estates and estates have an impact on. I've noticed that there are, there are many, many questions coming in on the right-hand side of my screen, so I'm going to go to them in a minute. And I'm reading them for the first time as you're listening to them for the first time, so I'm hoping you'll help me fathom out who's best to answer. But just before we move to those questions, just thinking on innovation, Paul, and you know the role that innovation will play with all this, what are you ex most excited about right now? Um, we're currently in the process of uh, finalising a contract to put a uh, a large battery storage unit on site to flatten our load across the day. Um, it's innovative to us. I know others have done it, but that's what I'm most excited about at the moment. I think potential heat storage units might be a, an interesting technology as well as that comes through. Great. Let's take some questions. Um, we've got a question from Edward. What happens with all the suppliers for all products, medical and other? Do they all need to be net zero for the NHS to comply? No, question mark, Edward asks. Who's going to take that one for me? Start. Okay, Michelle, that'd be lovely if you would. Okay, so um, the the NH the NHSEI are already speaking to the supply chain in preparation for for this because they are scope three in terms of the 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 the, the journey to net zero. Um, and uh, the suppliers that, that we deal with on our agreements, we, we meet with them regularly and uh, their journey to net zero is very much a standard agenda item on, uh, at those meetings because we want to know um, what they are doing, what they're planning to do and um, how soon they're going to be able to achieve it. So, for example, um, transport, uh, non-emergency patient transport, we want to make sure that all of the suppliers are using ultra low emitting vehicles as soon as practically possible. And uh, very helpfully, we've had some guidance out to say that that needs to happen um, in, in, in the next by 2030. So, you know, there are, there are plans in place. And uh, while we have to work with some of the SMEs to bring them up to uh, speed, the, some of the largest suppliers are probably ahead of us in terms of their journeys. Kirti, do you want to add to that at all? Yeah, so I think um, with scope three emissions, because it's really difficult to quantify, I think one of the first steps with supply chain and engagement is actually understanding how much of your own estate's footprint is from a particular supplier and asking them to provide an assessment of that or and just having that collaboration to understand where it is, where it's coming from and how, what you can do with engaging your local authority or your region to see how that supply chain's footprint can be improved. Um, again, travel measures, behavioural change, the way you conduct the activities, again, can be reviewed as part of that. But first, establishing a carbon footprint for that specific supplier for your um, operations, I think, is the first step that needs to be taken. Thank you very much. Let's move to another question. Um, Christina asks, will there be penalties for not achieving net zero targets? She says this will be key in seeing sustainability not just as a nice to have, which she says is still the trend in some trusts. Um, perhaps, yeah, Paul, go for it. Sure. Um, I, it's interesting to see how different trusts are approaching this. So some have set targets for 2030, which is well ahead of what we are required to do. Um, I think between the people who are going first and people like us who are probably going to be in the middle and people who trust who are going to be last, um, I guess penalties or some sort of 
some sort of negative enforcement will probably come in towards the end of the target periods, or at least bad publicity, which will move boards. Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Um, I am listening. I'm also, I'm also whizzing through lots of questions, working out what next. Um, Tony, most trusts will need to increase their electricity infrastructure in order to remove gas. This is significant and an enabler to real progress. Funding for this is needed. Is this understood centrally and likely to be available in order to allow trusts to make tangible progress in line with the net zero ambitions? Ian, is that perhaps you? Um, so, as everybody said, fun, funding is an issue. We, we've been looking at how um, what the, the longer term impacts will be, going back to, to what Michelle said earlier about the whole life costs of, of upgrades. Um, the electrical capacity one is, is an issue. With regards to moving to non-fossil fuel heat, um, UCL again have done some work that shows that if the, the steps are followed, so you reduce energy demand as much as possible, you look at um, the... Um, care more um, more remote clinical aspects, upgrade building fabrics ready for the heat, then there will be savings in um, energy costs annually, quite significant savings in en energy costs as long as that's done the, in the correct way. And then the other way we're looking at is the, the linkage with um, backlog maintenance. So all trusts will have a, a long list of backlog maintenance and there's ways that that can be used to support net zero and um, so that, that you're not looking for new capital you're able to use your capital better to, to do two things at once so that's hopefully the the what we're working on the data that we'll be able to put out shortly specific question on ng um dan asks uh, how are ng planning to manage their existing long-term contracts like gas-fired chp to decarbonize over the next eight to ten years yeah, so we are sort of part of the um, Heat Networks um, Trust. So we're actually working with government to develop decarbonisation strategies with each of our district heat networks to understand how we can make them more sustainable and how we can engage the local communities to do that. So we've started um, establishing decarbonisation plans and strategies for each of our district heat networks and gas-fired plants to see how, we, how and when the most optimum time to convert that would be. Um, we are looking at it holistically so not looking for a short-term solution that will be costly we're looking at the techno-economic developments around um, the ports and hydrogen infrastructure whether that needs to be looked at over a longer horizon where you see the innovation there and whether we need to consider that in our development so we are looking at that over the long term and leading that transition with government engagement as part of the heat networks organization that we're part of. I'd love to just touch a little bit, if I may, on um, new hospitals. And I don't know, perhaps because I'm from Grimsby, <laughs> from the north, there's something quite romantic. When you go to the Diana Princess of Wales Hospital, which is all bright and shiny and modern, I love driving in because there's all the old part of the estate and it feels like you're in, you know, call the midwife or going back to the 1950s. And there is something for me that, I don't know, it's quite magical about it, but obviously they're not sustainable. I'm just wondering you know, what the new carbon neutral hospitals will look like. Um, perhaps, Michelle, can you kick us off with your sort of vision of what we should be aiming for on that front? Um, well, I think for me, I, I, I share your romantic view of the, the mm -hmm. old estate. And I think the first rule of sustainability is is not to do something. So, you know, if the building is functional, we shouldn't be just discarding it uh, because there's a uh, there's a the, there's, there's a carbon impact to build a new building. So if if a part of the building currently exists, then we should do everything that we can to try and uh, decarbonize it. But where we have new buildings, we obviously have now the new building standards coming out. And, you know, we, the, while the NHS building standard might be new, there are lots of other building standards that have been in existence for quite a long time. So the design teams who, um, you know, design these buildings have got lots of experience, you know, making those building designs carbon neutral. So um, I think where we have to build, we, we you know, we, we will have good carbon neutral buildings, but where buildings already exist, we should do everything that we can to, um, to, to, to decarbonize them. Good, I'm glad some of them are going to stay. They're really gorgeous, some of the ones um, in Grimsby anyway. Uh, Matthew, what about the risks and opportunities in delivering net zero as part of the, the new hospital program?
Matthew, I can't hear you, so I'm not sure our guests can. Let's just see if we can get you back up. Matthew, will you start this again? Because we lost, just lost sound for a moment. Hi, can you, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear okay, you Okay, fine. I was going to link it back to actually probably the last question about Grimsby and Victorian buildings, because I've had, I've had the joy in the past of maintaining them, and they're dreadful. Um, so they're, 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 they're beautiful, and I'm sure that I'm sure they're, they're lovely for wine bars and whatever else, but not for clinical care. The um, the the uh, and, and what I'd say about for the, the new hospitals and the risks and the opportunities, um, I mean, clearly, clearly it's a challenge to make a new hospital carbon neutral at the moment and net zero. Um, and and, and it's rec that, that's recognised it will increase the capital cost. And again, the uh, new hospital, national new hospital program, the DH and the Treasury need to recognise that. The, the, but that, that's going back to the whole life cost issue of you know capital versus revenue and you you, you need to be looking this over at a 40 50 60 year period as opposed to the next next five um and, and i think that's uh, i think that's really important and and, and, and crucially there's, there's bits that we can do in terms of designing new hospitals to make them super energy efficient about your sources of energy uh, about how they're used and everything else but there will be external factors so decarbonization of the grid is incredibly important uh and, and all, all trusts are now meant to be buying their energy from sustainable sources so that's a good thing and it's an example of the nhs using its buying power to uh change behavior and i think that's a really really uh a really important thing so um but going back to how a new hospital will look actually this is the really interesting thing because of course actually the, the the patient and the visitor and actually the staff probably don't see the pipes and wires and everything else and they never should hopefully um you make a new hospital look great by having fantastic design and great art and thinking about the environment and uh making it a really pleasant experience for people who broadly don't want to be in hospital actually if you are going have to be there uh, to make sure you actually put in you, you have a tiny tiny amount of the capital budget go go to uh, of thinking about art and uh, engagement with you know patients and the public and that's how you make that's how you make a great hospital i've been interested particularly interested in this subject matter because away from my hat as a broadcaster and presenter i'm involved in helping airports intensify and go green and face their net zero targets, which are equally as pressing as the NHS. And I just wondered, are funded models looked at for, for example, EV charging and perhaps making the patient transport electric and perhaps putting solar in? Because I know certainly with airports post pandemic, when budgets are, you know, capital's tight and budgets are on the floor, funded models, are, there's been a lot of appetite. Is that something the NHS can embrace? I think that there's lots of experience of that. So um, Stoke Hospital did a really big solar PV project, which had lots of um, social benefits as well, that some of the income from that supported a local fuel poverty charity that um, clinicians were able to move people across to. Um, so, so there is that, and there will, solar um, and renewable will be one of the things that will be looked at in the delivery plan because the, the, it makes up that gap to get us to net Plus, there is the income generation where where the states have have surplus land or can work together to to do it over an ICS level or a bigger regional level. Brilliant. I just we've got about two minutes left, so um, let's see if we can just take a couple more questions. Lee says, "Are hospital trust budgeting for increased electricity costs over and above current gas costs once they move to low car carbon heat pumps, and will they look to implement so oh solar again solar PV?" PV to offset increased electricity costs if they haven't already. Um, As I said earlier, the, when there's in the estate's net zero delivery plan that comes out, it, it talk, talks about the data that um, University College London have done, and that clearly shows that if we do the upgrades in an incremental step, the energy costs will be cheaper, even with the, of the increased cost of electricity versus gas, because we should be specifying heating systems that are as low as possible because all the other, the early, the low hanging fruit's been addressed. Um, Guy says we're a small, medium charity working with the NHS. Uh, Guy says he's interested in thoughts about the best tool stroke provider to use for logging and monitoring our, oh, the question has now disappeared, for monitoring our carbon footprint now and ongoing. Can anybody recommend a, a tool or provider for Guy and his small stroke, medium charity? Well, I'm quite biased. So if you would like to contact <laughs> Benji. So at, least, at least you're open and honest. <laughs> Go on, Katie. <laughs> no, I think um, there, there are multiple tools available. So I think um, if you would like to just <laughs> drop us a note or any other equivalent supplier, we can obviously recommend stuff. We have our 
platforms to use as well. Great. Two more quick questions. Mark says, can we get to the point of mandating green steel and minimising concrete, etc.? NHS buying green steel would shift the market, which is key. Who's our green steel expert? Can, can I say, uh, perhaps I'll jump in, Helen, because I'm not a green steel expert, but I think this is really about, again, the new hospitals. And um, there's, there's going to be such a focus on making sure they're designed, um, you know, they're designed efficiently, they're delivered efficiently through um, modern methods of construction, but also that looking at embedded carbon and, you know, the, the mix between whether it's concrete or steel or whatever else. The, the, there's, there's, I mean, uh, because I'm, I'm, involved, I'm, I'm involved in it from the sharp end of being, being regulated, that, that it, it's, it's it's one of the four key drivers of the new hospital program so as to what the appropriate things are um, and i think i think the contractors and designers um it's going to be a real opportunity to uh innovate and to propose um you know modern you know modern uh methods of construction and and, and, and low carbon materials which i think will um people broadly will be pushing at an open door Michelle, one question I did want to ask you is about anchors and the work supporting a post-COVID um, green recovery and how how does it relate to estates? So the um, the anchor institution is really picking up steam now, and um, in London we have London Anchors, which I'm uh, a part of. So um, what we're doing is um, we're creating a number of um, targets each year to. Um, work with all of the trusts to um, this year we're looking at air quality so reducing the number of um, journeys that are made into London by um, internal combustion engine vehicles um, so we're looking at the supply chain we're looking at um, the, the the services that are delivered to trusts um, and we're challenging the the, the suppliers of those to um, uh, transfer their uh, fleets to ultra low emitting so the 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 trusts get the benefit of um, you know less scope three emissions and better air quality around uh, the trust buildings which means that the um, the number of patients requiring admissions for respiratory diseases goes down almost um, immediately as the air quality improves um, but through through that same scheme, estates can look at uh, things like um, purchasing more locally. So where um, the, the the estate has a local supply chain, um, you know, we can work with them to make sure that uh, that's the, the 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 local economy is benefiting from from the, um, the the volume of spend that the NHS has in that area. So there's a number of schemes and a number of ways that that we can work through the, the anchor movement to, to, to benefit the economy. Um, and the estate has a, has a big part to play in that because it has so much spend um, going, going through it. Paul, I'm going to give the final word to you and I'm smiling to myself because on my notes, I've got in brackets, plays trombone and excited about the net zero agenda, which was, which was from your, um, your sort of CV that you sent me, but it made me smile that you've got plays trombone on there. I'm not going to have the final word on the trombone, you'll be relieved to know, but I am going to ask you the other multi-million dollar question. Do you think we will get to net carbon zero by 2040? Uh, I think we will get to net carbon zero, but I wouldn't commit to when. So I think between the people who are far ahead and the people who are going to do it when they have to and the people in between, I think we're going in the right direction and it's great. Um, right now it's exciting, but I do think we'll get there. Uh, well that, you see, that's a bit of a cop out because that means we could be there by 2090, doesn't it? Um, and are you any good on the trombone? Um, you'd have to ask my wife. She hears it most. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. We've uh, we've gone nicely over our time because there was so much to talk about. It's been a brilliant discussion um, and uh, some fantastic questions through from you, our audience. So uh, thank you very much for that. And thank you very much to our panelists. I feel like we've learned uh, so much already and we're only just getting started.